Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today we have Professor uh, Dietmar Hatmaker from Australia. Professor Hatmaker is a biomedical engineer, an educator, an inventor, and a creator of new intellectual property opportunities. He's committed to fostering transformative research and pedagogical innovation, as well as programs that create an entrepreneurial mindset amongst faculty and students. He directs the Center for Regenerative Medicine and ARC Training Center in Additive Biomanufacturing at uh, QUT, an interdisciplinary team of researchers, including engineers, cell biologists, polymer chemists, clinicians, and veterinary surgeons. Professor Hotmaker is an international recognized leader in the field of biomaterials, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine with expertise in commercialization. He has translated a bone tissue engineering concept from the laboratory through to clinical application involving in vitro experiments, preclinical studies, and ultimately clinical trials. His recent research efforts have resulted in traditional scientific academic outputs as well as pivotal commercialization outcomes. His preeminent international standing and impact on cross disciplinary fields are illustrated by his ranking as a highly cited researcher. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks so much, Mehmet, and uh, thanks so much to you and, and Ali for, for having me presenting. Uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, to everybody in Australia. It's, it's very early morning. So today I would like to talk about uh, 3D printing technology, which we term melt electro writing, which gives us a lot of possibilities in respect to the design of uh, scaffolds, as I will show you during this presentation. I like to thank first uh, the people in my lab and specifically uh, for people who have been instrumental in developing with me this technology to the state where it is. Dr. Ona Bass, who did a PhD with me and is the postdoc with me. Dr. Felix Wunner, which did a PhD and is now uh, working for a big consultancy company. Pavel Mistrenek, who is still a PhD student with me, who did a master's first and is now in his last year of his PhD. Then my long-term collaborator, Professor Paul Dalton, which recently just moved to the University of Oregon to the new campus. Uh, and he will be arriving there next month. So, Melt Electro Writing, uh, I would like to show you a short video how it looks like. We have published a number of papers where we have described the technology. But here you see a, a video clip. So you see a print head and you see this fiber coming out. And classically, same as for solution electro spinning, you have a tailor cone. But the big difference is that you can work much closer to the collector and have much more control over the fiber placement, if you are able to control the process, which is actually not that easy. So therefore, um, when we look at melt electro writing and we compare it to the two technologies which you can compare it to, fused deposition modeling, the very classical 3D printing technology and solution like electro spinning, we think that uh, it is somewhere in between because again you have a, a melt electrusion process same as FDM and you also charge the fiber which is coming out with a very high electrical charge which draws the fiber which again allows you to get fibers down to uh, I think Paul has shown now down to 500 nanometers but usually in the submicron range. So here again are the differences and then one of the problems in the field is there are now quite a number of groups which use melt electro writing is actually the technology itself because most of the machines are as it often is in research are laboratory built but that makes it also difficult to really have a reproducible process so we have been focusing also the last couple of years to really forward the technology to, uh, to a level where there are machines which are almost at the commercial stage, which I will show you later. Because that's how we, how we started. Uh, so, so this is one of our, our second prototypes uh, you can see here, which looks quite rudimentary. 
which which did the job and you can see that it printed already on a, on a mandrel but obviously uh, again there was a lot of uh, differences between different students using the machine there was a steep learning curve for the student to to control the process and so on uh, but it gave us already quite nice results uh, and therefore again when you now want to develop the technology further it's quite important like any 3D printing or any technology that we find out via research what are the most important process parameters which control to make the process working. So for us what we what we did find out that there will be or that there are mainly five main parameters which we would like to control which you see uh, applied pressure because we drive the system with air pressure or with another gas, the melting temperature, the applied voltage, the working distance, and the collection speed, right? And here on the right hand side, you see that you have different forces which influence now uh, the fiber coming out based on these this parameters. So it's a complex multi-parametric process. So then the question is, how do you tackle it? So when uh, Felix came to my lab uh, more than six years ago from the Technical University of Munich, uh, we decided to do something which he had done before to apply a systems engineering approach that TUM is very strong in, in uh, looking at the process. So then uh, this is part of one of our first papers. So we wanted to uh, develop the platform to become more reproducible and to be really able to measure these parameters in detail. Uh, and this is done in these papers. And to do this, we broke up the process into that we would have the polymer preparation, the jet generation, as you can see here on the top, and the fiber collection. And then we broke this three up again into more parameters, which we wanted to look at and to control. Uh, as you can see here, and then relates this to the five parameters, the melt temperature, the applied pressure, the, the voltage, the distance, and the collection speed. So this is then the, the machine we built, which as you can see, looks very different from the first prototypes. And we did everything. We did not just the hardware, but we also designed and built this control box, which again, obviously is, is very important. Um, and here you see the technical drawers. And again, this is published if you want to get more details. And then we started when we had built the prototypes to really generate the data. And one of the first things uh, we looked at, as you can see here, uh, with this data set is it's a diameter because that would be very important to measure the diameter for consistency. So we changed the parameters and then we measured the diameter of the fiber which was laid down <clears throat> but again uh, i would like to come back so this is again our nozzle here uh, and you see this uh, bending of the fiber which is a very important uh, indication for us for controlling the process so we uh, published a jovi paper and, and again generated a number of uh, data sets and, and what was important as i said before in the past, the, the students had a steep learning curve in controlling manually these uh, five parameters. And then with the data set we generated, we could give them much better indications at which range in respect to the five parameters. They could control the process in getting uh, different fiber diameters, porosity, and so on. As you can see here, uh, 4, 13, and 25 micrometer fibers with these different parameter sets. So as I said before, then uh, what became quite obvious to us also that this uh, angle of the fiber, so here you see the real-time printing, fiber coming out, being laid out, and that the angle of this curve would be quite important and interesting for us to measure uh, and use as a control system because you at the end want to have a feedback, right? So we decided to do this via imaging this uh, fiber angle. Um, and obviously one of the issues of the process is also this uh, imbalance of the forces which happens 
with respect to filling off the, of the Taylor cone. So then we set up this machine uh, via the PhD thesis of Felix, which would allow us to have uh, one camera imaging the fiber coming out of the print head, and then another camera measuring uh, with the microscope the diameter and everything in real time. And then after the fibers would have been laid down and measured, they would be uh, sloughed, sloughed off and you would have a printing process. Uh, so this again allowed us to collect a large data set by changing uh, the five parameters. Um, this is the automation and again, the applied pressure, the melting temperature, applied voltage, working distance and collection speed was changed and then related to the fiber diameter. So this is the setup of the machine, uh, as you can see here. And this is a machine Felix built to do the work, to do the in-process control. So as I said, we got uh, a lot of data uh, which we measured. And here again, you see a video clip This is real time again, based now on different parameters. You would have a different bending angle of this fiber, and that could then be related to the fiber diameter we were collecting. So again, this is the nozzle, this is our fiber, this is the Taylor cone, and then this is what was processed in the software for the analysis. So uh, we were able then to determine the process stability, which was quite good in the 90 to 95% range, as you can see here. Uh, we developed a linear regression model, and then we calculated this correlation between the angle and the diameters. And this was for us something also then to determine process instabilities, especially in respect to the filling of the Taylor cone, which could lead to instabilities. But uh, again, one of the challenges we had was that, that Felix collected more than 40,000 data points. And the question was, how would we uh, compute them now? So we discussed this with our uh, bioinformatics people. And what we came up with at the end is what you see here, that we created this heat maps, very similar what would be do, done in uh, you would do a genetic engineering study. Here again, you see the, the plotting of the different parameters. And then again, depending on which fiber diameter you would like to print, you could go into this charge and then determine which uh, process parameters you would uh, like to use. And again, uh, from the processing, then it's very clear that the decrease in the angle the relevant uh, low mass flow would be influenced by the voltage. The mechanical forces of the collector would play a major role because of the dragging when the fiber is on the collector. And then of course the extruding forces, the pressure, and the temperature, uh, which you would have in your, in your print head. Uh, so this would relate to the angle and here you see the same thing for the, uh, the diameter. Uh, so this was quite nice for us now to get a handle on this uh, uh, process parameters, which again uh, are a very important part in developing at the end the uh, in-process uh, control system. And obviously uh, work we are doing now is also moving towards AI uh, to implement this into the process itself. So here again, you have these heat maps, with the different uh, process parameters and here in respect to the diameter. So again, if you know which diameter you would like to have for your scaffold, then you can go into this charge and you can use these parameters right away. Okay, so this was all good, but uh, we always have to do system verification. So Felix also did this now. Uh, so he went in and I said before, he decided on certain diameters and he, uh, not by try and error, put in 
this data points for the voltage, the collection speed, and the melting temperature and the applied pressure. And then he measured the, the diameter and the angle, and you could see a very good correlation, as you can see here in this uh, charts. Okay, so again, uh, this is all good, but, but one of the uh, issues we are still facing, even so the process uh, gives us a lot of control in respect now to designing uh, architectures with high resolution via, via the melting process. One of the disadvantages of this process is actually it has a very slow throughput. So there has been uh, other groups also trying to work on this problem. And you see uh, some of the concepts which have been proposed. Uh, one concept from Aachen to use this, as we would call it, shower heads, where you would have multiple fibers coming out from multiple nozzles. But the problem is that you lose then all the control that you actually are getting, again, a non-woven if you, if you do this. Uh, so therefore, we... Uh, had a number of discussions and we came up with this concept. And the concept as shown here in this uh, video clip is that you have now four print heads and you print from two sides that you print upside down. So you have a collector where you print on two sides that the collector is now quite large. It's about, uh, 900 by 900 uh, millimeters. So this was our concept. And again, uh, this was something then uh, we wanted to build. But then, of course, one of the, the issues which the is are not printing from the top, but you're printing from the side. So the question is, uh, does gravity have an influence? Because obviously, the, the volume and the mass of the fiber is very low and so on. So we, we studied this and then we decided not only to study this, how to print from the side, but also upside down. And again, this was work of a PhD of, of uh, Felix. And again, based on our previous work, we could determine now quite nicely again, based on this five parameter sets, what was happening in the process and how we could control this, uh, if you would print from the side of upside down. Um, and how we would have to change the uh, parameters. So there was a small effect, uh, especially with, with larger diameters, if you would uh, print upside down, which could be corrected for. So uh, then we did build this machine, which would allow us now the upscaling, which you see here. Uh, and again, everything was done uh, in, in our labs, the hardware and the software. So this is now the, the control unit, which is quite complex. And, and this is the, the machine with the eight print heads. And again, we print uh, on both sides. And then we tested the machine. And here you see examples. Uh, so you can either print now a lot of small scaffolds. The scaffolds are 10 by 10 millimeter. Or you see here a scaffold, which is 800 by 800 millimeters. Uh, and as I said before, you would print on both sides, which again would allow you to be much, much faster and also have an upscale process. And then we uh, again looked for the quality and we could see that the large machine, the upscale machine, also was very close to what we have seen in respect to precision and accuracy on our smaller machines in respect to diameter and fiber spacing. And here again, you see that we then also tested, uh, you know, scaffolds on the different regions. And again, you see a nice correlation and a nice precision overall. Since these are more than uh, 800 scaffolds on this, this platform, which we printed. And here's a large one. Uh, okay, so again, this is the, the work which is really required to develop this 3D printing process, which allows us now to have highly reproducible fabrication. 
and the number of labs around the world which have our machines. And we also constantly get uh, asked if we could build machines for other labs. One word of caution, uh, obviously there are a number of uh, commercial machines, uh, either uh, machines which claim to be only melt electrolyters, or a number of the bioprinting companies have set up uh, melt electrolyting printing heads on the machines. But none of these machines can do what I just showed you. Um, I've been asked often by uh, groups which have the other machines uh, that they cannot reproduce our results. And obviously this is a question of how the machine is built and really what the machine can do. And especially the bioprinters, they have no capability to do uh, the constructs, especially what I'm going to show you now in respect to making very complex uh, scaffolds. So again, now with this technology, one of the areas we focused on from an application point of view was to look at uh, soft network composites, uh, which we all know are a very uh, important topic in our field. Um, so, especially in the area uh, for blood vessel tissue engineering, ligament tendons, muscles, heart, and so on, we would like to have constructs which mimic uh, mother nature. And uh, how can we use now this technology to build constructs which allow us to mimic some of these functions? So, Again, the concept, as you all know, is that we have a, a fibrous network which is filled with the extracellular matrix, which could be defined from a material science point of view as a hydrogel and a combination of the two gives us amazing properties of our tissues, uh, not just mechanically, but then also biologically. So, uh, as I said before, we, we uh, use this concept now for the fiber reinforcement and uh, which allows you now to have uh, systems which really are helping you in respect to the mechanical properties, but also allow you to really uh, have a biology into the system which is favorable. Because one of the issues is uh, that, for example, if you just work with a hydrogel, obviously you can do a very strong cross-linking. You can get a very strong and tough hydrogel, but then you have an issue with the biology because your cells are not surviving, they cannot proliferate and so on because the gel is too stiff. Uh, vice versa, if you have a very weak gel, which is very favorable for your, for your cell proliferation and differentiation, then you have a, a, an issue with the mechanical properties. So if you have now the fiber reinforcement, you can uh, have both. So again, uh, with the melt electrolyting, we can have now a lot of control in respect to the design. And this just gives you a simple way. So if you want to mimic now the, the curly structure of the collagen, you can, can do this, uh, not just have straight fibers. So one of the first studies we did is we, we compared this uh, curvy architectures with straight fiber controls. Uh, we, we use this in combination with, uh, with hydrogels, with alginates, with gelma, and so on. And uh, here you see, again, the uh, scaffold architectures we used. And we created specific molds to do the uh, hydrogel injection. This is work from uh, Dr. Ono Bas. And here you can see the differences now in respect to the mechanical properties. On the left-hand side, you see this curved architectures of the fibers on the right-hand side, the straight ones. And you can really see that we are able to mimic the J-shaped curve when we have this curvy architecture. So here you see the scaffold is already broken, whereas this one is still intact. Uh, still elongation. So we studied this in, in great detail. This was uh, part of owner's PhD. And what we could see is if he combines this now with, uh, with the hydrogel, that we could increase 
the system in respect to mechanical properties 100 or 125 times. Uh, which obviously, as I said before, is something you like to do in the area of uh, soft tissue engineering. So one of the, the tissues we do a lot of work in my lab is cartilage tissue engineering, where uh, we use the system now. And uh, one of the hydrogels we like to use, uh, that's why we also had a nice collaboration with is Ali's group, is, is the Gelma system where uh, we use Gemma in this case, and we use also alginate. Uh, and again, we design specific scaffolds with different porosities and fiber spacing. And again, uh, quite important, as you can see here, you can go up to 98% porosity of the scaffolds. Then uh, if you look at the hydrogels itself, then you see the stiffness. And then when you do the combination, then again, you see this uh, tremendous increase in mechanical properties in using the fiber network in combination with the, with the hydrogels for both for Gelma and Alginate. The mechanism for, for both are a little bit different because they are different hydrogels. Uh, oops, sorry, I should, yeah. Um, so, so what happens is that uh, again, here you see uh, microscopic images of the scaffold. So you see that the fibers are not straight. And what happens is when you inject now the, the hydrogel and you put the system under compression, that these fibers get stressed as the hydrogel is pressing against the fibers. Then the uh, fibers are, are put under tension. And that gives you this uh, tremendous strength increase under compression, which you can see here also in the, in the data sets we, we generated. Even with very weak gels, you get uh, up to 50 times increase in strengths uh, by using the hydrogels. So as I said before, this obviously uh, is influenced by the hydrogel itself, because the question is how hydrophilic or hydrophobic the hydrogel is, and how quickly this water is pressed out uh, against the fibers. Uh, so that's something we study now also in, in detail. Um, sorry, I should say also a few words to then the uh, biology. So then we combine the gels with, uh, with chondrocytes. And again, the advantage is that you can use a very weak gel now, which is very favorable for, for the cells. Um, and for example, here we use the mesh, which had 97% porosity fill it with gelma or the alginate and you can see here that we after four weeks of culture get very nice formation of extracellular matrix we have a lot of cell proliferation and survival and uh, this is all related that we can work now with a, with a very weak gel but still very good mechanical properties so another uh, work this is uh, elena de pardo She's, she's now a senior lecturer in Perth. Uh, she worked very closely with us on, on this system, on hardware, and also Petra Mella in Aachen. So again, we, we are able now to mimic really the, uh, the collagen architecture of, of hard leafed cells. Uh, and in comparison to solution electric spinning, you really have the connection of the fibers. They are not just lying on top of each other, but they are really bound, which gives you um, increased mechanical properties. Um, and this is a PhD of uh, Navid Sadi, who uh, then also looked at how the fibers are arranged circumferentially and radially. And again, we did a biomimetic uh, architecture, as you can see here. Now the printing becomes quite complex and also the coding. Uh, and then he uh, went to Petra Mella's lab and he did some studies and also the cell study. And again, you can see, you can work with a very weak gel, get very nice uh, proliferation in ECM formation. And, and here again, you see in detail the different architectures you can print and the variation in respect to pore size, uh, angle of the curvy structure and so on. Um, and here you see also that you can print even sinus valves 
And here is a view of how the swells are opening and closing. So this is in a mock circulator in, in the lab in Aachen. Uh, again, this was done with Petra Mella and Joachim Lockenhövel. Uh, and here you see how we print. So here we have now a collector, which has the shape of the sinus valve. Here again, you see the nozzle, the fiber comes out. And then obviously, as I said before, it is challenging but doable now to control this print pass for this complex architecture. And then again, you get this very nice structures and even uh, at very small diameters, you are able to print with a very high, high precision. So we also have a, a, a patent application. So here again are the close-ups. And you see very nicely here these architectures. And these are fibers, uh, again, which can go down to a sub-micron range if you, if you like these designs. OK. So the other very exciting application, it's a more recent one, is actually that, uh, that Ono had the idea to use this system for soft actuators. Uh, it's a pretty new field for us, but as I said, very exciting. So we, we did a lot of uh, literature research and so on. And we uh, then discussed how this technology can really be uh, making an impact in this area. And uh, as you can see here, there are a number of groups which also work with fiber reinforcement already in this field. Uh, however, and some of them also use 3D printing. But some of the challenges is, uh, is uh, the resolution and also how small you can get with the dimensions. A lot of those uh, published work are, are very large constructs, not small ones. And a lot of them are uh, actually also not very fast. They are very slow. Uh, so here you see some work where people try to, to mimic uh, muscle architectures. And again, they were able to do that. But when you, when you look at the dimensions, uh, those are very large. And, and again, also very often very manual uh, processes where, for example, these fiber networks are manually uh, wind up of mandrels and so on, which obviously is an issue for, for reproducibility. So again, with our technology now, with this fiber network, we can make, again, you know, very complex uh, architectures. So if we know which fiber network we would like to mimic and how, uh, in which direction we would like to optimize, we are able to do that by a different type of designs. And uh, this is work together with a, with a group at, at Harvard from the modeling side. And uh, here again, you see some of the images and we can print down on mandrels with a diameter of uh, one millimeter. So again, from an application point of view, there will be multiple tissues which would be uh, of interest. But of course, first, the things you need to do is, is to do the fundamentals. So here again, you see now different designs. Uh, so based on the design of the fiber network, you really get this, uh, actuation movement. So the fiber network architecture is really driving uh, the, the movement of the actuators. So in this case, we used PCL together with a, uh, with a silicon, but obviously different material variations uh, could be used. But these two materials were our, our workhorses. Uh, and here you see, uh, based on the different pressures, how it gets these deformations. Uh, based again on this uh, fiber networks uh, and you can do all kind of uh, movements. Here you see elongation, you see the twisting 
here again you can also see how we how we mimic uh, the the muscle how muscle would be pumping uh, and here's some of the twining some videos now Here you see how fast the actuators are. And then we uh, modeled this together, as I said, with the Bertoldi group at Harvard. Uh, and uh, again, what you can see is that we need very small inflation volumes, but still get very fast speeds of actuation, which to our knowledge, nobody else has shown so far in the literature. Uh, Again, here is now a video which shows you how fast we can go up to 30 hertz. It's not 10. Twenty. So, so one of the, the issues in the field uh, is obviously also an issue for us, where are the applications? So one of the, the applications just to show the potential of the technology is what you see here, a fly catcher. So you can see here that the fly is catched without the, killing the fly. And that if you take away the actuation, and the fly is released. It's just flying away. Uh, so obviously this is just, just uh, to show the potential of the technology. So we are still looking into, into applications. So one of the applications we discussed with clinicians is to use the system in minimal invasive surgery because the advantage would be that in comparison to the endoscopes which are used now, which are very stiff, but you could have an endoscope which is very flexible and would be able to go to regions inside the body by taking advantage of the flexibilities. And this is just the video which shows you how this could be done in principle. So then the last thing I want to show you is, so uh, the actuators I showed you before, they, they are plyometrically driven, but then of course, again, uh, we can think about driving the systems with, with hydrogels. And this is again, very exciting, more recent work, where we use different type of, of hydrogels and we uh, also do this uh, shape morphing uh, based on the swelling of the hydrogel will then deform system which is determined by the fiber network and again this shows you again obviously this process is much slower uh, but in principle how this deformation works and this is again a video clip and this is now this is a hydrogel very nice controlled deformation. And again, we are studying now a lot of the fundamentals in respect to different hydrogels. Uh, and that is work which is coming up. So uh, one of the ideas we have is also, uh, there is this concept of uh, sacrificial bonds. Uh, published by Paul Hensmer many years back, how bi biology designs this fiber network. So again, we are able now to, to, to mimic the sacrificial bonds in this fiber network architectures. So this was a work by an Italian student who worked with us for uh, a year, as a Nino. And you see quite nicely, as I said before, that you can now design the sacrificial bonds inside this fiber networks. And then from 
the mechanics. You can see quite nicely now in this uh, video clip that if you put the system now under tension, then the sacrificial bonds would be the ones which would break up first, but overall the construct would be still intact. And then of course, one of the next things you would like to do is to work with uh, self-healing polymers, which would allow you to really mimic mother nature as close as possible. Yeah, so here you see again in principle how it works. And, and here are the mechanical curves. So I think my time is up so that we have enough time for questions. So thank you very much for, for listening and I look forward for the discussions we have now. Thank you. Um, dear Dipmar, excellent talk. Appreciate uh, so much about melt electro writing. A couple of questions came in. Will the printing outcomes change by varying the fiber material? Yes. So, so for each uh, material, you have to optimize the parameters. So if you, uh, for example, our, as I said before, our workhorse is uh, polycarbolactone, but we have uh, used other polymers, especially Paul. So again, for each uh, polymer, you have to optimize the parameters. Also, is it possible to print different structures instead of these mesh-like structures? Yes, it is. It is. Um, you can almost print anything. It's just the, the big advantage we see with this technology is this fiber networks, but you could print other structures. Okay. Is the mold for heart valve sinus valve swallow sacrificial? What were the polymers used for mold and electro writing? So again, we, we used uh, mainly polycarbolactone, uh, especially Paul. Paul has done a lot of work with different polymers, like polydioxanone and so on. Um, the mold is not sacrificial for the hard valve printing. Okay. There is uh, a, a special way how we, how we release, release the scaffold. Okay. Yeah. Can this printing be performed embedded in liquids, like uh, embedded printing? Uh, yeah, Paul and I, we, we have done some initial experiments. It's, it's very challenging, but we think it's possible. But we need to do more work to be more confident that it can be done reproducibly. Okay. Is there any way to reduce the distance between the nozzle and the writing bed to improve the control over the melt electro writing process and resolution? Yes, well, maybe this refers to the videos I showed you, which had a working distance between five and 10 millimeters. Yeah, but you can go down to, to one, uh, one millimeter. One of the uh, issues you have to be aware of is the sparking, right? So uh, that is something you need to control. So as closer you go to your collector, as more you have to be aware about that you don't get sparking between your, your nozzle and your, your collector. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Regarding the melt electro writing printing, is it possible to incorporate drugs into the polycaprolactone or other materials? Um, well, in principle, yes, but, but again, you, uh, you're working out of the melt, so, so you can only incorporate drugs which are stable uh, around 80, 90 degrees of, of temperature. Um, but again, if you work with uh, low melting polymers, uh, which again, Paul has done, then you can uh, embed drugs. You also can uh, work with a, with a co-extrusion system uh, where you work with uh, two different type of polymers and you can have then uh, the drugs embedded. So there are a lot of possibilities. So, uh, and overall, when you, when you look at the literature, it is still quite a young field. 
And as I mentioned before, one of the issues is, that especially is the commercial machines, that they are very limited in what they can do. And I think that's, that's a hindrance, why there is uh, not much more progress at the moment with, uh, with more different type of applications. A follow-up question came from Paul Dalton. Yeah. If you had 10 million for R&D, where would you direct this funding? Well, there are two hearts beating in me. So the so one direction I would go is um, really in uh, building machines and commercializing machines that other labs really can uh, reproduce what Paul and I have been doing um, in the past. So this would be one direction, which 10 million might be not enough. Um, the other direction where the, the other heart beats in me, of course, is the, the application of these constructs uh, towards really uh, treating of patients. So what I haven't shown you, uh, we have used a number of these measures in, in uh, I think more than 10 large animal studies from periodontal regeneration to bone regeneration to skin regeneration. And we have uh, very good results, some of them uh, which are published already. So this would be the other direction I would then concentrate on uh, one application, for example, skin or bone, and really drive it into the clinic. So I need 20 men. All right, all right. What is the current status on integrating artificial intelligence for the process optimization? So the, the current status is that, that Pavel, uh, my PhD student, uh, he has built uh, another machine, a more advanced machine to the one you have seen from, from Felix Wunner. But we also uh, do now even more detailed uh, data capturing uh, and look in more detail uh, now on the Taylor cone, as well again on this, uh, this fiber angle and uh, this, this data will then go into a uh, machine learning algorithm after he has generated those. And then we want to feed back this into the, the in-process control. So this is ongoing work. Okay. Do you use natural fibrils, amyloid fibrils too? No, not yet. Okay. Is it possible to provide adhesive properties in melt electro wetting biomimetic fiber using biopolymers? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Again, this depends on the, uh, the choice of materials then, and then of the, the, uh, the architecture. So coming back to my comments about the in vivo experiments. So we, we have compared, uh, you know, FDM produced scaffolds to the MEW scaffolds. And based on, you know, that you uh, can go down now with the resolution that you get much faster and better tissue integration just based on this physical differences in morphology, right? So, so I think this could be also uh, taken then for looking into adhesive properties. Okay, what is the minimum uh, fiber diameter in the system that you can get by by PCL. So again, I, I think Paul has shown that he can come down anything between 500 to 900 nanometers. Okay, very intriguing talk. Melt electro writing seems to have a lot of potential. What are your thoughts on uniaxial, biaxial, or even triaxial woven scaffolds? Yeah. Absolutely, that, that's if you, if you want to mimic some of the, uh, the builds of uh, Mother Nature, then, then you need to go towards this direction. And, and again, when you, when you look at the, the hard wells or the soft actuators, then, then I think uh, this is definitely the trend we are moving towards too. Okay, um, nice talk. Did you already try to use this technology to print with living cells? Uh, we haven't, but I think there was just recently a paper by uh, Jos Malda, 
uh, who, who showed that this is possible. I see. Uh, you're using um, electrohydrodynamic technology. Is that correct for printing? Yeah, that's another term, yes. I see, I see. Okay. Excellent work. That's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate, uh, you know, fascinating results. Thanks for having me. And if there's uh, more questions, people can just drop me an email and I'm happy to answer those. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, Pamit. Thanks, Ali. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.